we were talking about the functions of the gods and we talked about father gods and generative gods or uh, maternal gods and also about gods of perfection right gods that are responsible for divine perfection uh -huh. and um, remember the general idea here is that there are some things that have to be true about orders of gods about groups of gods and since there's no overarching structure that they conform to it's going to be some god within that order that fulfills that function and um, it is interesting that we're starting back up on proposition 154 which is about protective gods um so that's how dodds translates it do you have the text with you just give me a second let us protect this exactly so again um it's been a while so i'll repeat some things uh so this locution all that is protective in the gods or amongst the gods i don't know why Prakas speak that way instead of just saying all the protective gods, right? Or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as I can tell, they're, they're equivalent expressions. And also in this case, uh, Fruretikon. So that is, it's protection, but it uh, refers to like uh, the activity of a watch or a a lookout um so it has this idea of you know looking over something not just protecting it right um i checked to see how the word is used in the septuagint and there it's used to translate or rather not the same word but uh same root is used to translate uh nitzavim, so garrisons uh, protecting places um but anyway and and so now we're going to look at these gods that are responsible for keeping um uh, each god and each being in their own lane so to speak why don't you read the um read the title and also the whole text then we'll get to and then yes. we'll talk more okay All that is protective in the gods preserves each principle within its proper station, so that by its unitary character, it transcends derivat transcends derivative existences and is founded upon the primals. I have no idea what that second part means. Okay. Um, so that... Um, so there's um, a few things here. So first of all, each principle, right? That's um, uh, Dodd's adding more context here because it's just in the Greek, it's just each. And then you can ask what, each what? First, it seems each God. Um, and I'll get back to that. But here it says that by its new character, it transcends derivative existences. So the, um, the ones that are the derivative things that are inferior to it. So it's independent of them and exists independently of them. And it is founded upon the primals. So it has an immediate connection to its causes. Right? That's the founded in, in, in the primals. We saw this corresponds to a proposition that we saw about the order of the gods. Let me um get it one moment um there are a couple of things here so first in 150 he talked about um god's transcending each other so in 150 he says any processive term in the divine orders is incapable of receiving all the potencies of its producer 
as our secondary principles in general of receiving all the potencies of their priors. The prior principle possesses certain powers which transcend their inferiors and are incomprehensible to subsequent grades of deity. So that's one side of the transcendence. So they have powers that the inferior things don't have. And then in 146, I believe, no, not 146. Um, I'm, okay, there's a proposition that we went into that I'm not finding at the moment, which is, is this idea that everything that, you know, that um, everything, the higher it is, the more it's connected to its causes and the more it transcends its effects. And the lower it is, the more it's, it depends on its effects and um, the, um, the, the more it's um, far away from its causes. So noose is, you know, inseparable from, from the gods or, and at the same time is uh, more, transcends uh, uh, soul is completely, is independent from it in a greater way than the soul is transcends the body and is present to noose right so the soul right so the soul can turn away from noose and the soul sometimes becomes dependent on the body and follows the body's changes whereas noose never has this kind of thing it's always uh transcends its effects its soul and it's always established in the gods mm -hmm. uh, and and so that's what he's he's now he's talking about this amongst the gods and now you we have to remember here what we always say about causality amongst the gods that it's actually the relations that hold between their the beings that they produce right each god has this being that primarily participates it and we say that one god generates another because it the being that it produces is a cause for the being that that produces in the same way that we say that one person is the parent of another not because one soul produces another but because the bodies of the parents produce the body of the other um of the child and but there is no direct relation here between souls and and so here he's so in a sense what he's saying is that the protective gods are the gods that are responsible for all these beings that are attached to the gods staying in their own, you know, being attached to their own god and having a good order of superior and inferior. Um, so this uh, corresponds to not only what we just talked about, but the um, superior and inferior relations, but also he's talked a lot about the, the, um, the primary uh gods the first ones the middle ones and the last ones and so that's also an, ex an example of of uh of order that's preserved here um right so that that's the background to to what you just read more questions okay so and who would be the 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 uh the the principles here do they have names like the protective gods so uh, yeah so protective gods um so for instance in um in the platonic theology proclus gives the example not of the gods but of certain mythical events and he's talking about the castrations of the gods so when um uh, Kronos castrates uranos and becomes king and then zeus castrates his Kronos and becomes king. He he sees these as activities that um, separate the different realms of being from each other, right? And so he 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 calls that in that context a um yeah like a a, a, a protective monad, and. We can think also of number itself, which is mythically identified with night, and it's the principle through which each, there's a, this correspondence, one god, one being, right? One god, one genre of being. 
And so it's also something that's protective. It you know establishes a one this one to one correspondence. Um, and in in general, yeah, the, the I mean those are two examples that come to mind now. So this is something like like the protective in the sense of keeping the limit. Yes, of keeping the limit, keeping the order. Like watching the borders. Like watching the borders, yes. Yeah. Um, not, yeah. And um, watching borders inside and outside, but also like the um, inner articulation, right? So, yeah. Um, the, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of like, so of more examples, but so this is like the this kind of a of function is sometimes attributed astrologically to Saturn. It's, Saturn is connected with limits and people doing what they should and discipline and so on. Um, but and I mean the demiurge does a lot of this in in the in the in the Timaeus, although he's not primarily a protective god, his primary function is, well, being a demiurge and an engineer creating the world. But he does a lot of this of you go here, this is your function, this is what you do. Um, that That's what you're here for. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's, uh, as you say, protecting the borders. Okay. Um, should I do the proof? Yeah. Okay. For if the gods differ in their distinctive properties. No. Sorry, I'm in the wrong one. Uh, with with one fifty four. I I'm sorry. I found it. four. If the divine protection immutably maintains the measure of the station assigned to each, and conserves in their pro in their proper perfection all the objects of its care, then. So if divine protection mutually and conserves, uh, then it implants in all a superiority to lower principles, set each in steadfast independence without alien admixture, or it has the property of causing in its objects an uncontaminated contaminated purity. And lastly, founds the being of each upon the principle superior to it. For the perfection of any existent exists in its laying past hold of its of the primals, remaining steadfast in its own being and preserving the simplicity by which it transcends. Yeah. Um, so this uh, this three um, this threefold division of the the primals, its own being, and the lower, we also saw this in Proposition sixty five, right? Everything exists in three ways: in one way, in its prime, in its causes, in a originary fashion, as a power there, in itself, in its own existence, and then also as an image in the things that participate in it. And here is, um, I mean, the the proof here, as far as we get a proof, is just like an explanation of what um, uh, protection would be, right? So he says, well, if protection is making sure that each thing is in its own station or rank or order, it's the same word, taxis. And then given this, you know, threefold division, given that order is a causal order, and so it and and it implies a relation to oneself, a relation to one's cause, and a relation re, relation to, one, to one's effects. This looks like this, right? This looks like establishing things in their causes, making sure that they're dependent on them, and then making sure that they're in themselves, they are what they are, and also that they're that they transcend their effects. Um, he talked a lot about this being established in your in its causes when he was talking about things that cause themselves and why does something that causes itself never uh, um, never disappear, um, never cease to exist because it, it's never separate from its own cause since, it's, since it is its own cause. So, and, and so that there was just as a negative, but in general, it's, um, it's this being 
uh, rooted or connected to your causes that uh, ensures your existence. And if we want to, so this is really just like an explanation of what does it mean to be protective. If we want an argument for why do the uh, um, why do these protective gods exist in the first place? Well, we have to uh, think about these other prop propositions that we've already seen that there is that there is order amongst the gods, and there is a first and the second and uh, and a last, right? And but then again, and then combine that with the fact that there is no structure of the gods that isn't produced by the gods themselves. So you're going to have to have some kind of god that produces this, which is the protective gods. And um, lastly, this last phrase is is like a nice little expression of perfection, right? Like like what perfection is for Proclus, right? The perfection of a, of any existent. And uh, yeah, it means of, of anything, really, consists on the one hand, laying fast hold of the primals, remaining steadfast in its own being, and preserving the simplicity uh, by which it transcends the lower. Um, the um, And here we can see that perfection depends on this good order. And this proposition was about the per per protective gods. And then prior to that was the one about the perfect gods. Uh, gods, the gods that are causes of perfection. And so it seems here that these are actually the more general gods, right? They have something more, uh, a more general effect that is establishing this good order. And the perfect gods are then a, like a, their activity is subsequent on this good order, right? Because you can only have good, you can only have perfection within order. At least that's what this proposition is saying. Um, and, um, yeah, you can, um, you might want to say, we've talked about different ways of, of thinking about gods and whether they are ordered like beings or whether they in themselves are each of them absolute and there's no order amongst them. Th a proposition like this seems to support the view that the gods in themselves don't have higher and lower. They organize themselves into higher and lower. And this, and especially these, these specific gods have this um, activity, but in themselves, they're, they're all, they're all united and therefore they're all um, absolute, each of them. Um, right. Um, that, um, but that's you know, a different issue. We've seen some propositions that push more towards one reading and others that push toward or towards another. Um, you have uh, more questions? So, so if I understand the basic concept, something like we have this like general principle, like say 65, like yeah. a general causal principle of how causality works and everything in the world. Yeah. Now, um both all of these kinds of principles are somehow um created out or born out of the gods so there's needs to be gods that are responsible for all these kinds of principles that makes yeah. sense yeah so like yeah, why does each thing exist in its if it cause and effect on itself, well, because there's a god to the who that's his name or something like that, responsible for that kind of principle. Kind of, yeah, and that also sort of is that true? Yeah, yeah. And there's a and where, whereas for other things, things believe beneath the gods, we can always appeal to a higher principle and ultimately to the gods to explain why these causal principles are true of them. For the gods, it's going to have to be the gods themselves that. Right. Okay. So, so yeah, that was the two things. That, so, so like, if you do this, like, why hundred a bunch of time, and they say, well, why this, this, because it has a cause. Well, why do things have causes, right? I think have causes because the gods said so, whatever, because there's these gods uh, that are responsible for that. And then something like, what does it mean for the god? to be the cause of things having causes, it means the gods themselves uh, organizing themselves as a cause and effect. 
And what does it mean for the gods themselves to have a cause and effect? It can't be like cause and effect before them. So it has to mean they're being like a god of protection who then somehow makes the other gods into cause and effect or at least makes them seem like that for the things that depend on them. Right. Um, so the... Um, yeah. So two things to make that a bit clearer. Um, first of all, is that what one part of the answer of like, well, how do the gods, um, you know, organize themselves into cause and effect? Well, they they all have. Well, this is an issue. Like, well, if you're not being circular here, but they each of them produce, and it's a question about what this produce means. But each of them produces a being. And then through these beings, they organize themselves, right? By organizing these beings. And second, um, so if if we're just if we're, if we're going to look like this here is going to be the principle for causal order, right? Why there's a first, a second, and a last. Why each thing has its own order in the causal system. If you want a principle for why there are causes and effects in general. That would be the generative gods, right? They're the uh, they're the ones that are responsible for there being potency and multiplication and things. Um, but yeah, in general, that that's what these, especially these ones from one fifty one to one fifty four, and so you can think of like one fifty one is what it, it's uh, it's the you know the, the paternal gods, and they're connected to the good and the production of existence. So this seems, and right, this seems to be connected to remaining in the good. And, and so remember all the, every effect remains, proceeds and reverts to its cause. So it seems like the, the paternal gods are connected to remaining, the generative gods to proceeding, the perfect gods to reverting. And then this, um, these protective gods or surveying gods are um, then have to do with like the unity of remaining procession and uh, reversion, right? Because it has all three things, has um, playing fast hold to the primals, that's remaining, remaining steadfast in its own being, that's um, maybe reverting, or proceeding, I don't know how to do the one-to-one -one here, really, and preserving the simplicity by which it transcends the lower, right? That has to do with it pr producing other things. Um, and, yeah. So, in general, there's this correspondence mm -hmm. between uh, general causal truths and, and divine functions. Now we're going to go into 155 to 158, which is a bit about a bit more specific divine functions that's about producing things in the world. But um, we'll go at, at it one, one at a time. So um, do you want to go to 155? Yeah. Okay. So 155 says... All that is zoogonic, nice word, or life-giving, and this, in the divine kind, is that another way of saying amongst the gods, is a generative cause. But not all generative order is zoogonic. For the generative is the more universal and nearer to the first principle. Right. So the um, he's distinguishing here between yeah i've always pronounced this zoogonic so okay. not zoo, but um <laughs> anything of a zoo yeah um <laughs> but anyway it is uh pro what produces life right and so he's saying that the you know that this is a subclass of generative right so generative is the one of 152 that we saw that I said I'm pretty sure is um, connected also with being maternal 
a maternal deity. And so that's the one about procession in general, right? That's what uh, the, the, the generative is. Whereas the zoogonic is about creating life specifically. Um, and this is much bigger than just um, living beings that we see in, in, in the world, right? For Proclus, for Proclus, for instance, Noose is alive, right? And there's this first life. And if we go to 90, wait a minute. Uh, um, all that uh, in, in position, um, proposition 102 in the text of the proposition the proof, he says, um, life communicates the movement inherent in it in as much as life is the first procession or movement away from the steadfast substance of being. So what's specific to life is that it's procession from being, right? The um, So the generative gods are responsible for procession in general and including the procession of beings, the, the, the production of beings. Whereas life means procession amongst beings, right? And so um, this is connected with the idea that what, what is alive, um, something that is alive, if it changes itself, it, it has some inner principle of change of, of itself. So it's uh, something that instead of just uh, staying and being what it is, it has some kind of procession, some motion towards something else, some, some new being. And and so that's the distinction here. The, the generative is the production of everything, even the production of being, whereas the life-giving is uh, procession from one form of being to another form of being. Um, you can uh, now read the proof. And, or, 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 or if you want, let me, before I do that, let me give examples, right? So examples of generative um, gods are, oh, um, eternity ion is um, is one that's uh, generative or chaos and um, again right or, or even uh, the, the living being itself which um, uh, Proclus identifies with the Orphic Phanes which is the first god to appear this um, form of Eros right so they're all things about that bring that are responsible for existence in general whereas zoogonic ones are like Rhea the mother of Zeus wife of uh, uh, wife of Cronus who she is for Proclus responsible for the souls the, the substance of souls right and so that's specifically connected to life right um in a broader sense, all the gods that are responsible for life as an order, right, for unparticipated life. So these are night and also what Proclus calls the connective deities. These are some deities that he mentions in the Chaldean oracles and also the perfective deities, which are these deities um, responsible for initiations. They are all um, connected with, uh, they're all zoogonic as well, but in a more general way. Um, there's not a um, a clear break here. So there's like things that are absolutely generative because they produce being. Then there's a, these these ones that are produce unparticipated life that is clearly zoogonic, but it's the production of the inner articulation of being itself. And then there are things that produce living beings here. So like this um, Rhea, the, um, the mixing bowl that's responsible for souls, or later also the the heavenly bodies, the junior gods that are responsible for creating the the body of human beings and also all the irrational uh, beasts, right? These are also zoogonic. Um, and so uh, the, those are examples. I guess at the extreme, there's Circe, right? Who I've mentioned before, she's responsible for administering transmigration. 
right? Making sure that there are always enough tyrants so that we always get wolves. And and that's also a zo zoogonic activity, right? Um, uh, so yeah, that's uh, the distinction being made here. What's interesting is in a way that, so we talked about how, you know, you have to have these generative gods so that you have causes and effects at all amongst the gods and you have orders of gods. Um, and that's uh, something functional. That's about the structure of the divine orders, right? The gods have to structure themselves. But what's zoogonic, that's about, that's specific content, right? That specific kind of thing. And so here he's kind of saying, you know, like, the uh, the gods responsible for producing a specific kind of thing, they're actually a subclass of gods that are just responsible for structure, right? So he is, um, and this is what he's going to do from 155 to 158. They're all about how the gods that are responsible for a specific kind of thing are actually a subclass of gods that are responsible for a specific structure. Um. Yeah, um, so so much of commentary on the on the title. Do you want to read the pr proof? Okay, but that makes sense because kinds of things are also just very specific kinds of structures, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, four generation signifies that cause which advances existence to plurality. Well, cool. Are you read more than one thing? But Zoagani describes the divine which bestows all life. Okay, those are just definitions. If right. then the former of these multiplies the number of substantive existence, while the latter, the Zoagonic, uh, constitutes the successive order of life, orders of life, the generative order will be related to the Zoagonic order as being to life. Okay, so he's just connect showing the connection between these two things that if one is responsible for being and other life, so their source also has the kind of relationship of being to life. Yeah. Or like you said, other beings to some kind of uh within beings uh connection. Yeah. Will therefore be the more universal. Yeah. And productive of more numerous effects. And for this reason, it'll be clear to the first principle. As we know, that more universal things are and more effects it has, that's what it means to be closer to the first principle. Yeah. 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 So so that's a way of, uh, of thinking about it. Maybe since the gods relate to each other through these primal beings that uh, participate them then maybe in general we can think of those functional gods uh the eternal generative perfective as protective as all connected to being and then these others as that we'll see as connected to, to to lower order so here in this case it's life um that that might be a way of thinking about it although there are like um the functional gods exist all the way down so for instance the first intellectual gods right the first gods that are responsible for news are also called paternal because they are the beginning of the series and the beginning of the series is always a father right and things like that um so maybe we can distinguish between the strictly paternal which are up there in being and then paternal in intellect or something like that um but that's just a, an idea I had right now. Yeah, I see. Yeah, so now that the next one will be the relationship between purifying gods and protective gods. Right. So in 156. So 156 says, all that is the cause of purity is embraced in the protective order. Okay, so that's a kind of, in other words, or purity is a kind of protection. Yeah. But not all the protective is conversely identical with the purifier, right? Because one is greater than the other or more inclusive. Right. Yeah. 
I don't know what purity is, but okay. Maybe we want. Um, okay. Um, so what is purity? Um, often in Proclus, it means not being... Um, okay, uh, so the, the Platonic dialogue about purity for Proclus is the Phaedo, right? And the Phaedo is like, it's the one where the philosopher is described as the one who is learning to die, right? And the thing he most desires to separate himself from the body. And so they described um, like um, in the, uh, the, the Neoplatonists, they had this theory of many grades of virtue and they distinguish between the purificatory virtues from the political virtues. So the political virtues are ones for people who still somehow see themselves as souls with bodies. And so it's about controlling your body, being moderate. Like you, you have emotions, but they're in the right order, in the right time, right? And and courage is like being able to um, to risk your uh, to risk your body, to risk uh, life and limb. Whereas the purificatory virtues are the habits, are the dispositions of mind of people who identify entirely with their soul, and they don't identify with their body, right? So. Um, it's like courage taken to an extreme where you're like, you're dead. You say to your body, you're dead to me. Um, and, and so it's where it's not where you like, you, you only, you don't eat too much, but where you just don't care about, about eating. You just eat the bare minimum. It's not like you, you say, oh, I have to give myself a treat sometimes to keep myself working. No, someone who has the purificatory virtues is happy just to like really um, feed himself and doesn't need to uh, a treat now and then. And and so that's um, so that's this idea of purity. It's separation from the lower. Um, purity is also connected with um, crime and transgression, right? So this is uh, common in Greek tragedy, but also like it's a motif in like and Greek writing Herodotus in history as well. So there's something awful happens, a plague or people, you know, it's a, um, an atrocity is committed, then what you need to purify yourself somehow of the pollution that comes with this, right? That um, transgression creates a kind of pollution and then you go to the oracle. What does the oracle say? The oracle says you have to build a shrine to this god and do these sacrifices. And then you go and do it. And that's the the purification. That's the the, the washing away. Um, in the in Hermias's commentary on the Phaedrus, there is a discussion of, pur of purification. The Phaedrus too. It's one of the four divine kinds of madness. Is the madness of purification. And uh, and there it's the idea of like this inspiring uh, inspiration of oracles telling you what to do. But then he discusses also rituals that are for people who, for instance, their soul actually belongs to uh, to Mars, right? It's a martial soul. And so they should do something connected with um, with being a soldier or war, who knows what. But when the soul chose its life, it chose the life of a poet. And, and so this is some kind of fault that you bear, right? That you chose the wrong life for you. You've betrayed your vocation. And this is also some kind of pollution that you need to uh, remedy with the appropriate uh, rituals. And then if you do those, then you'll continue to be a poet because, I mean, you're, you've stuck, you're stuck with the life that you've chosen so far. But you will be able also to fulfill your functions as a martial soul in some other way. Um, so these are, um, uh, all examples to give another more, more colorful example. So there is a house in Athens that's been dug up and piece of, uh, many people think that this is actually the Academy of Proclus's time and it's where Proclus lived. It's called Proclus's house. And one of the things that they found there was a pig, a whole pig. Right, it wasn't eaten, was just killed, sacrificed, together with seven cups. And the um, um, and there's a researcher, was one of my advisors, Christian Wilberg, 
he has an article where he defends this is tied to an episode in the life of Proclus by Romarinus, where Proclus had a dream of like the of a statue of Athena being destroyed, and then Athena comes to him and says, I'm going to live with you. And then he asks, well, what do you do when you have a dream like this? How do you prepare your house to, re to receive a goddess? And then he shows, uh, it's a, he quotes a tragedian, I forget which, to show that there wasn't as an association of, of sacrificing a pig um, to um, clean an area, to purify an area and make it receptive of divine influence. And the number seven is connected with Athena because it's the... Um, it's a prime number, and it's a, a prime number that's, that doesn't have any multiple between 1 and 10. It was somehow connected with virginity, and then with um, Athena as a virgin goddess that uh, is born outside of, and by jumping out of Zeus's head. And, and so he argues, okay, so this was like a purificatory ritual to receive um, the, the presence of Athena. And so all this stuff is about also like we talked earlier about these propositions about the presence of the gods where, um, you know, the gods are are actually omnipresent. However, um, there can be places where for some reason the place or the thing isn't itself receptive. The god is there, but the thing isn't receptive. And so purification has to do with this of making things more receptive to divine influence, removing things that are obstacles, right? Um, and so in the, um, and the, these can be transgressions, pollution because of a crime, um, or it can be also like if you're attached to your body, right? If you're still someone who thinks like feeding your body and eating nice things is important for you and so on, this is... Um, this is distracting you and this is turning your attention away from noose, which is always available, always, you know, always shining. And, and but you're just distracting yourself. And and so that's what these are the themes of purification. Okay, so uh, if I could, yeah, thank you. So if I can make it something more uh, abstract, like where we're here, um, something like um like protection is each thing being what it is, and purification is something like not each thing not being confused or not being mixed with things that it's not. Yeah, as we'll um, as we'll see when we read the proof, the the abstract notion that Proclus has is that purification is separating yourself from the lower things, right? Not confusing yourself um, with the lower things. And we saw that that was one of three parts of protection, right? Protection is connecting you with the higher things, making you be you, and separating you from the lower things. And purification is just that last bit. Okay, very good. Okay. Um, I see. Okay. Um, all of this, where am I? Uh, yeah, four. The divine purity, okay, uh, isolates all the gods from inferior existences and it enables them. So that's the transcendence of the gods yeah. from the lower things and enables them to exercise providence towards secondary things, providence being something we discussed earlier without contamination. So sort of, although it, we did this, right? Although it's present in the lower things, it doesn't somehow get contaminated by them. Yes. That language for that same thing. Right? Whilst divine protection has, besides the further task, so that's what divine purity is, right? If, you, if we're very specific about purity, it's the ability of gods to remain isolated from the inferior things, even, you could say like this, even even while them ex they exercise providence towards them. Yeah. And that's also why in the Platonic theology, the first clearly marked purifying gods only appear in the intellectual order. They only appear after the demiurge. 
because the demiurge is the first one to turn, you know, he, he, he turns towards material things, he fashions the world, he puts order in matter. And, and so it's only then that there's like this issue about, um, well, you have to, even when the demiurge is interacting with matter and with lower things, he still has to preserve his transcendence. And then uh, Proclus identifies the, the Kurites, which is a, a group of gods that I, I don't know much about um, as the ones responsible for this uh, protection. Um, they're mentioned in in the laws as well. They're somehow connected with dancing. I don't uh, know exactly. Um, um, my, my my conception of them is a bit fuzzy. Okay, but that's the pure flying gods. Okay. Um... Whilst divine protection is broader than that, has besides besides isolating from the lower, has the further task of maintaining all things and their proper being and of founding them securely upon the higher principles. Thus, the protective is more universal than the purificatory. Purif purificatory, I don't know. The distinctive office of protection as such is to keep each thing in the same station relative to itself and its priors no less than to its consequence. That's that's protection. That, yeah. that the purity to liberate the higher from the lower. So sort of in the gods, it wouldn't like be an, it's just them being like that, but if it's like an activity that we do, then it's gonna be like a story. Like once you were not pure, now you become pure. Is that right. the... Yeah. And these offices belong primitively to the gods. For any general character must have a single antecedent cause. And it is true universally that in the gods, the unitary measures of all things good are pre-embraced, and nothing good is found. So how do we get into this? And nothing good, this is like a general argument for all these things here, right? And nothing yeah. good is found in secondary existence that does not pre-subsist in the god, what other source of course does it have? Purity then being a good belongs primitively to the gods, and so also protection and other like offices. Okay, yeah. so that's argument. So at the end, there's this extra argument for like, oh, why should there be purity and, and protection in the gods? And in general, and it's a general argument for like why any good should be primitively in the gods. Um, this is, I think this is a function of just how this text is still incomplete. And so like this, it's this, this argument should come earlier, or maybe it's also just another way of saying what he said before, that each god is a good. Right, he's uh, had proposition about this. Each god is a specific form of goodness, and um, so here it's uh, it, it comes to aid and to explain why there's purity and um, um, amongst the gods. But um, yeah, I think this is like distinct from the so the um, from the argument that he just made. First, there's the argument that um, that is the proposition, right? Which is that um, uh, the Protective is more general than purificatory. And then there's this add-on, this uh this lemma, if you if you will, about how there are um there's a, a good for um there's a god for each kind of good. Um but in general, I think it's um like um it's also connected with this idea of the relation between structure and content. So the the protective gods are about this structure and about structure in general that there is structure, first, middle, and last. Whereas the purificatory is something much more concrete, as I gave all those examples. And so you're saying this concrete thing comes from that structural thing. It's actually just a little part of that structure. Um, that's uh, that's how I um, read it, and. Um, yeah, just seeing if I have any other further notes about this. And yeah, no, just that the um the proposition that uh, says that each god is a kind of good is one thirty three. But besides that, there's, yeah, I just attribute this to the imperfection of the text. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, we're we're doing well with time, so I think we can we can make it to one fifty eight. So, 
157 is now going to distinguish between paternal causes, right? Those that are responsible for existence, that are at the head of each series, of each order of the gods, like, um, like the good, from demiurgic causes, right? Which are causes of form, right? So, um, well, and, and again, this is a structure and, and content. Structure, any order has to have a beginning. So it has to have a paternal God, it's cause of existence. Uh, and so that's about the structures of the divine orders. But Demiurge is a, is, a, is a function, right? It's Zeus who creates the world, or it's Hephaestus who's the smith god and who for um, Prochus attributes a few different things to him. In one, in one thing, specifically the shape of the world, that it's smooth. Um, and uh, so that's... Uh, um, the distinction he's drawing here. Um, why don't you read the um, the title, which is long? Yeah, okay. Whereas, it is the function of... No, no. Where am I? Yeah. Please. Proposition 157. Yeah. It is the function of all eternal causes. No. That's 157. No, whereas it is the function. Yeah, whereas it is the function of all paternal causes okay. yeah, yeah. to bestow being on all things and originate the substantive causes of all that is. Okay, that is their function. Yeah. Is the office of all demiurgic or formal causes to preside over the bestowal of forms upon things composite. The so the general paternal causes are just being, and these are after there is some some composite thing to give it a form. Yeah. The assignment and also the assignment of their stations and their numerical distinction as individuals, that there's one and another one. Yeah. Um I'll I'll have a, a comment about that, but just finish. Okay. The demiurgic is thus in the same succession as the paternal, but is found in the more specific orders of gods. Right. Um, are these orders. Yeah. So here, right, there are three things that are functions of the demiurgic. So one is the production of form for composites. Um, it could not, uh, this can be, you know, that there's a composite thing and then it receives form or basically or composite meat here can mean things made out of form and matter right and in things made out of form and matter the demiurge is responsible for the form part right and then uh, the assignment of their stations for uh, Proclus just says in general uh order uh, the production of order right um so so that means in general so you see here how the demiurgic is, seems to be also part of the uh, of the protective because it's causing order. And then he says the their new so in Greek it says the dis, their distinction according to number. Now according to number can mean two things. It can mean the numerical distinction as individuals, but you know. The fact that each thing is an individual is connected with the fact that it is one. And that has to do with unity and uh, and with the paternal causes, right? Because the cause, the paternal causes cause existence, and they're in the same and they play the role of the good or the one. So I think the better way of reading this is as um as producing their distinction according to number as in according to different series. So Prochus will call a series of things a number. So like um, he will talk about the number of Helios. So all the things that are connected to the God with Helios, right? Or, or the number of souls, all the God, all, all the souls. Is he, he a word for that is the number of souls. So according to number can mean that he divides the different numbers, right? So he divides things according to their classes, according to their numbers. And and so I think that's um, that might be a better better read here than um, as individuals. Um, 
it's precisely not as individuals, but as members of of chains, right? Um, members of causal chains. So there's like the number of, of human beings, it's all the human beings, but thought of as this um, species that perpetuates itself from generation to generation to generation. Um, and right, so he, so these are the three effects of the, of, of demiurges, of demiurgic gods, um, engineer gods, craftsman gods, and as opposed to the paternal gods, which cause uh, things just to be, right, and gives them existence. Um, and so you can already see from the description that the paternal is going to be broader because there are things that are and that aren't form matter composites, or that even uh, that aren't even parts of of series, right? So in particular, being itself, right? When you uh, prior to um, you having many beings, it's still not you know intrinsically part of a series. And in general, the monads of things aren't going to be parts of series. You know, the, the series is posterior to it. Um, and, and, and there are, th and the, the other thing that's perhaps more known, the demiurge works already on some pre-given matter that already exists, whereas the paternal cause just gives existence. And so it causes even matter. Um, uh, one part of the background to this is that Plato in the Timaeus calls the Demiurge the maker and father of the universe. And then there was the Platonists developed this whole scholasticism around father and maker. And so they distinguish between the father and the maker. And then Proclus has like four levels. There's the truth. There's the one that's God's that's just the father, then there's the God that's father and maker, but mainly father, then maker and father and mainly maker, and then just maker, right? And maker here is for, um, for Demiurge. So that's um, part of so the- So father here is, is the pattern, what the general thing- Father here is, the, 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 um, so, so the, there's, a, there's a deity in, in the Chaldean oracles that's just called the father which um, seems to be, you know, the, the one that produce, that for Proclus is, is the one that's responsible for being itself, right? Um, and um, in general, but in general, any god that's at the beginning of a series is going to be called the father, of, a father of that series. So even the Demiurge, because he's at the, he's amongst the three gods that are at the beginning of the series of, of, intellectual gods he is also called a father right zeus is also a father although he's primarily a demiurge right um and so so that's um those are examples yeah um the yeah shall we get to the uh, the proof yeah, so for, for both these causes, so both the uh, paternal causes and demiurgic causes are ranked under the principle of limit. Okay. okay. Since existence has like number and form a limitative character. I don't know what limit means here now. In this respect, the two are in the same succession. Right. So um, let me let me explain what limit is. So um, he introduced way back when, when discussing um, the source of power, he introduced limit and infinity, right? And he he said that, but he was really interested in infinity in those propositions, infinity as primal potency. So, and we've come up across infinity again, the propositions about the gods, and I've argued that it's actually the presence of the gods in each other. And it was mentioned before in, in 152. So, 
in the same way that the paternal gods are said to be in the place of unity here in one uh, 52 it says that the, he says that all that is generative in the gods proceeds in virtue of the infinitude of divine potency right and so and later he says that it mirrors that infinitude which is the primordial parent of the universe um so there is here an idea that these are god and this makes sense if you think that you know infinitude is the primary potency is the ground for why there's any causal power at all its power itself and and so these um the generative gods which are the ones that are responsible for their being causal um, causal relations amongst the gods they in some sense are implementing infinitude within within the divine orders okay um and there's a pair to this which is a limit which would be the principle for again if, if infinity is is being in something else or something else being in you then limit is each thing being itself and it's um there are debates amongst the scholarship about whether limit and infinity are some kind of super henads that are responsible for organizing all the gods or if they're posterior to the gods um is limit actually a word for each god as an individual and infinity a word for the uh, the power of each god um so it seems clear to me that infinity is going to be the presence of the gods in each other limit might then be something like the um the the unity of the god the remaining of the gods in unity Right, so each of them being itself, they're remaining in unity. And, and to, well, bring this to here, he talks about the order of limit. And this has to do with oh, an old Pythagorean idea. So the Pythagoras had the Pythagoras had this had this table of opposites, right? So like limit is on one side, infinity is on the other, odd is on one side, even on the other, male and female and things. And Aristotle talks about this in the metaphysics. And, and so there's, you know, there's a series of things that are more like limit, and there's a theory, series of things that are more like infinity. And he's saying here, well, the, the, um, uh, the demiurgic and the paternal are under limit. And he says, because existence, like number and form, is uh, uh, is ha is has the character of limit, and we can understand that in the sense that form, uh, you know, constrains matter in some way. Matter has many potentialities, and form realizes one of them. And and number as well, you know, number is a, a limit, the counting. But he also says existence, and for existence here he uses hyparxis, and that's always to refer to individual existence, to, to a thing's own existence. And, and so he's saying, you know, being having your own existence is also a kind of limit because you're not something else. Um, and and so he's saying, okay, so they they're both in this have have the same kind of activity since they're both limitative activities. Um. But then he's going to say, you know, why the demiurgic is inferior or more particular. So that's from but the demiurgic. Um, okay. Um, so both of theirs on it is but the demiurgic advances the creative office into plurality, whilst the others, the other without departure, sorry, while the other, whilst the other without departure from unity originates. The processive order of things' existence. I don't know what that means. Uh, yeah, he's over translating a bit. So without it's without departure from unity is it's it should be something like in a unitary manner. Um, so he's um, but the the real difference here is that the 
the paternal causes procession because it causes existence, right? And and it causes individual existence, right? I, I think that's what the without departure from unity or in a unitary manner means, right? Um, it it makes each of them a, a one procession, but the demiurgic. So there's a couple of differences here. First, it's the creative office, right? So he has he creates poiesis, right? And that's not a word that he uses for the paternal, and it's connected, right? It's connected with making things. Um, right, so it's a la sot, it's not livro. And it's into plurality. So it's, you know, it makes many things and it also, it makes many things from a pre-given plurality. So, so that's the, this first distinction that he makes. Um, let me just, this is 157. Um, so here and yeah, I think this is, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just checked my translation to see if that brought additional clarity, but it's basically just what I've already said. So you can, um, did that explain that phrase? Uh, sort of, not entirely sure. Okay. So let's... Like two dif the difference between creation and pluralization? Or... Yeah. So, yeah, you can say that it's a, um, yeah, it's a creation uh, versus like making versus uh, plural uh, pluralization, uh, making versus giving being. Yeah. yeah. But demiurgic doesn't make anything new, sort of. It's just organizing things. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, I'm not sure what the plurality means, though, exactly. Um, just a multitude. So yeah, the, the the paternal makes there be many things, and it makes new things come to be. Whereas the the demiurgic is just making, uh, starting from a plurality. It's making more things. So that's a good way of saying. It. Instead of making things, it's making more things. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's making more things. You could say that. Yeah. So it it's uh, it presumes that there are already things. Okay. Um, again, that's about another thing. The one creates form; the other existence. That's the same thing, or another another thing. That um, here the here he's distinguishing what they they make. So mm -hmm. if before he said one makes more things and the other makes things, right? Um, now he's adding a, an additional distinction. The first makes more things by creating form, right? And the second one just makes things by giving existence. Yeah. Okay. Um, as being then, as being then, well, depends from the forms, right? We had this whole thing with being being prior to intelligence, which means forms and so on. Yeah. So does the paternal from the demiurgic. Yeah. Right, so right, we saw that being is prior to forms. A form is a kind of a whole. It's a universal whole that's present in all its instances, and that all the instances make up this like one system. Whereas you know, prior to the notion of form, then is the notion of whole, and prior even to the notion of whole is the notion of being, because also the part has some being, even though it's not a whole. The part qua part. And and so that means that being is prior to the forms, right? And and so if being is prior to the forms, then also the paternal is prior to the demiurgic. 
being is more universal than forms, then also the paternal is prior. To the, uh, the paternal is more universal than the demiurge. Mm -hmm. Now, form is a particular kind of being. Accordingly, the paternal being the more universal and more comprehensive cause transcends the demiurgic order as being transcends form. Yeah, that's... Yeah. So that's the thing. And, yeah. Um, again, the specific, the content, giving form to the world, giving form to things, the craftsmen of the world, blacksmith, god like Hephaestus, these are a subclass of the paternal which is um you know which is a structure present in any divine order in any divine order there's going to be a first one and it's going to be the the, the father of that order um let's uh let's see if we can do 158 because then we'll finish these different functions so 158 is about elevative so um, these are like gods responsible for, con especially uh, gods that are responsible for connecting us for souls with the gods or um, and, and amongst, uh, amongst the gods, you know, connecting lower ones with higher ones. Um, so um, you get like Hermes sometimes has this epithet of psychopomp. So it's the, the, the the god that accompanies souls after death. And then that's associated by Platonists with, you know, leading souls up to the gods after death. And so that's uh, elev these elevative causes, of raising causes, right? And then he's going to distinguish that both from the purification. And then he's going to talk about the conversive kinds. This conversive for me, I think it's identical with the perfection that he talked before. Um, so elevative is a kind of perfection. Right. He's or going to, yeah. purification. So these are even smaller. Yeah, he's going to distinguish all three uh, from each other. So why don't you just read the text? Oh, uh, all the elevative text. cause on one fifty eight. Yeah, okay. All elevative cause among the gods differ both from the purificatory causes and from the conversive kinds. Four. It is evident that this cosmos also must be found primitively in the gods, since all causes of all gods presubsist there. Okay, that's a general right. thing. But it is prior to the purificatory, which liberates the lower principles, as we just saw, whereas the elevates affects conjunction with the higher. So I don't know what the difference is. So in some sense, it's prior to kind of purificatory, which I don't know. Right. Um, so here he's saying that they're prior because they produced a greater good. And implicitly, the idea is that you only purify yourself from the lower things in order to join to the higher things. And so since the goal of your action has to be prior to it, so that means that joining with higher things is something prior to um, release from the lower things. Um, so to start with the ethical level, so we talk, I talked about what purificatory virtue is, where, you, this, where you, you really identify with your soul and you just feed your body and you don't care about it. And what happens to it, um, you really don't care about dying um, because you really just identify yourself with your immortal soul. Um, and he thinks that there's beyond purificatory virtue what he calls contemplative virtue, which is where you don't just identify with your soul, you are have a habit of constantly thinking about the forms, constantly contemplating. That's contemplative virtue. So it's one set of, of dispositions of mind that will lead you to basically um, just treat your body as little as possible really see it just as an instrument and it's another which leads you then to constantly um, uh, think about higher things because the thinking about because you can just disconnect from the from lower things and just think about yourself just contemplate not the forms but the reason principles the concepts that are in your soul so that's like doing mathematics 
right? And so like an example of a purificatory um, uh, art or science for Proclus is mathematics because it separates the soul from uh, from the body and shows that it has these pure concepts within it, which it couldn't have, which, you know, it couldn't do mathematics if it didn't have innate concepts and if it wasn't independent from the body. Um, but that's something lower than like dialectics, which should train us to have insights into the forms. And um, and so that's what he's saying here, right? So that the what elevates us, what connects us to higher things is prior, um, is a prior because it's a prior goal, a higher goal than simply freeing ourselves from lower things. Of course, you have to free yourself first in time before you can attach yourself to the higher but um in the order of like reasons the um the, the late the thing that happens later happen is prior right what's uh um yeah, the, the end of the process the beginning of the thought um and and so that's what he says about the relationship between the elative to the purificatory now let's see what he has to say about the elative and the conversive this is from on the other hand on the other hand it has more specific rank than the conversive since anything which reverse may revert either upon itself or upon the higher principle that's conversion whereas the function of the elevative cause which draws the reverting existence upwards to what is more divine is characterized only by the latter mode of reversion Right. So whereas the elevative just turns us to the higher things, the conversive can turn us either is called, responsible for things turning to the higher things and to themselves. So it has, since it causes more things, it's going to be a higher principle. Um, this but is a. It's still better, sort of, the elevative ones. Yeah um the he, he says some weird things here first of all when he says that anything which reverts may revert either upon itself or upon the higher principle that's not entirely true because you can revert upon lower things it's just wrong and bad right you can you shouldn't um turn your attention to bodily concerns or you should free yourself but you can do it that's a um a problem and and again, usually, you know, the, the higher is also the more general. So why isn't the ele elevative also the cause of conversion? That's unclear. Um, it's also unclear. And yeah, I don't know. Maybe Maybe it's really the idea that the elevative will just be these concrete gods that you know lead us lead our souls up to noose and then up to the gods and whereas the conversive gods are like these structural gods they're responsible for turning in general i don't know it's um it's unclear to me what the mm. um yeah there's he seems to be start he seems to start juggling too many kinds of gods um and it's uh, what one one commentary is that he here he develops this taxonomy from one five one to one five eight, and we find these terms in in the in his other works, the um, yeah, in his commentaries on Plato and the Platonic theology. But he he also talks about other kinds of gods, and we're going to talk about soon about kinds of gods that are distinguished by what they produce um so it's, un, it's unclear what's going on here right but um just saying that you know there are other taxonomies of gods and other works and there's overlap it's not that the terms that show up here don't appear elsewhere but there is never this exact way of dividing the gods up mm -hmm. um so so that's this that ends one five uh, one to one five eight, which is about these different functions of the gods, and um, then next time we're gonna start on the last bit, which is one five nine, 
to 165. This is the last bit on the gods. And it's going to be about distinguishing gods according to their products. Do they produce being? Do they produce news? Do they produce soul? And it has in the middle of there, for some reason, there are also propositions about divine news again and divine being. It's an object of divine news. Um, I'll have some words about why those propositions are there. And it starts with the proposition about limit and infinity that's really important for the debate. But about henads and, and how they relate to each other. But I'll talk about that next week. Um, next week we're okay, the twenty second. I mean, I hope so. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Me too. But um, so it was. Um, it was a great uh, starting again. Yeah.